imagine what it will be like. Yes, it was. Amen. Good morning. Um, it just so happened that the text that the lectionary planners have out for us today give us some beautiful uh, images uh, that go along pretty well with baptism. The reading in Revelation about the water as a gift from the spring of water of life is a beautiful image of God's endless overflowing gift of water uh, for God's people. And then this passage from the Acts of the Apostles talk to us a little bit about the ramifications of the Holy Spirit being shared, not just with one community, the Jewish community, but with the Gentiles too, and the baptism of Cornelius. This is a story from the 11th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. I invite you to open your heart and your mind to this reading of the Word of God. Now, the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had accepted the Word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, pick it up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were, the Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. The six, these six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered a man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in the house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as it had on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they had heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. And may God bless to us our reading and our understanding and our applying of this word to how we live our lives. Is God predictable, or is God strange and inscrutable? Well, I guess that depends on whether you're paying attention taking in the long view. Uh, in many ways, what we're learning during this Easter season is that God surprises, right? God doesn't quite do what we think God would do. God doesn't act in the way God would act if we had our druthers. Uh, but instead, every time, in each moment of surprise, God expands what, it, ex what uh, we have as our understanding of love or welcome or compassion. I mean, if we're paying attention to Jesus, it probably shouldn't be much of a surprise, but, but sometimes our minds are set on things just so. I was doing some reading this week, trying to better understand what's going on here in this Acts passage, and to set the stage, one theologian offered her own story, a, a modern-day parable of sorts. If, if you're familiar with Jesus' parables, this may sound familiar to you, some of the cadences of this story. Here's how her parable goes. There was once a woman who had a big rambling house, a house with many rooms and a porch swing and a spacious front yard. And she was a generous woman. So day in and day out, she hosts guests, right, at her home, politicians, 
celebrated writers, celebrities all stopped by in their travels, and, and so did old friends and acquaintances just passing through. The woman loved to sit and just listen to their stories at her big dinner table. And, and her reputation for hospitality grew so much so that people down on their luck, you know, showed up on her lawn asking to camp out. And people who had not bathed in many weeks were taken in and washed and fed, that sort of thing. People traipsed in and out, so much so that the front door of her house was hardly ever closed. And the woman rejoiced that she could host so many friends. Well, one autumn day, this woman was called away on a journey, you see. And so she asked some of her most trusted friends to house sit for her, you know, just while she was away. And, and she packed up and she departed on her journey. And, and a few days go by with guests traipsing in and out. And then one of the friends said, you know, the draft from that front door is terrible. I'm going to go shut it. And so she did. And then another said, have you noticed that all these guests have been, you know, dragging dirt in here through the front hall? And, and another said, some of them drag in more than dirt. Did you smell that kid who came in here yesterday? And another loyally, you know, said, the, the woman of the house is our friend. We should honor her by, by tidying things up around here. And so they set up to work. You know, one of them seen clean the carpets. The other one dusted the furniture. One cleaned the chandelier. That seemed pretty good. And then, and then a guest came through the front door and left it wide open, you know, swept in some fallen leaves. And the guest accidentally, you know, trampled on them and crumpled them a little bit. Um, that made the friends, well, angry. <laughs> Look at what you're doing to this house. The lady of this house should not be treated like that. Get out, they yelled. And they, and they shooed the guest out onto the porch and shut the door, and they turned the lock. And then, from, from then on, the friends took turns standing guard at the door. They made people show identification before they entered the house. Guests were asked to sign agreements not to make any mess. People who smelled funny were all kept out, of course. People whose manners weren't quite up to snuff were sent packing. People who spoke too loudly were excluded. Those who showed up without shoes were left outside. Those whose opinions were uncomfortable, were snubbed. Well, wouldn't you know it, thankfully, the flood of guests turned into a trickle, and the friends congratulated themselves for keeping the woman's house in good and in decent order. And then one spring day, the woman returned, you know, bearing extravagant gifts for her trusted friends. And, and she reached the door, and her arms were full with these boxes and bags, and only she was puzzled that the door was closed. And with a free hand, she, she turned the handle only to find the door locked. And so she rang the doorbell, and a face appeared at the window. You're home, a face uh, mount, mouthed through the glass. Why is the door locked, she shouted back. Uh, the front door opened two inches. Another friend's face appeared, and this one said, you'll be so surprised. I mean, your house is so clean, you'll hardly recognize it. The woman said, where are all my guests? Oh, the friend said, they were messy and caused you so much trouble, we've sent them away. Sent them away, the woman asked. But they were my guests. Where, who are you to send them away? And besides, didn't you remember that you are also my guest? Maybe I should send you away. This is my house, not yours. Did you hear that? One friend whispered to another, she's clearly unstable. She doesn't know what's best for her. If we let her have her way, she'd undo all the good we've done. And with that, they shut the door and locked it, leaving the woman and all of her gifts outside. Ouch. Okay, but here's a different story. One fine day, we hear, according to Acts, the apostle Peter was praying. He had a vision, a, a dream of sorts. The vision was something like a tablecloth being lowered from heaven, and it had a huge picnic meal spread out on it. But there's a catch. This feast, the one from heaven, remember, was made up of unclean food. Food from animals like reptiles and carrion birds and pigs, all the things that Peter knew that as a good person of faith he could never eat, never. God had said not to eat those animals, you know, and doing what God said was important to Peter, as it should be. And just a few things to note, the Jewish people were a religious minority in the Roman Empire. They were constantly in danger 
of losing their identity in this great tide of the Greek and Roman culture. And so, for good reason, first century Jews were concerned about maintaining social and religious boundaries. I mean, observant Jews didn't eat unclean animals. They, they didn't eat with people who ate unclean animals. They didn't vi visit Gentile homes. And since the early Christians were all Jews, they didn't do these things either. They had very good social and religious reasons not to. And to be clear, Gentiles generally felt the same way about Jews. The two just didn't mix. It wasn't done. Better if our kind stays here and theirs stays there, it was said. But in this vision, a voice told people, Peter, get up, kill, and eat. Peter refused. By no means, Lord, I've never eaten any unclean thing. And yet the forbidden buffet was presented to him a second time and a third time. And a voice said, each time what God has called clean, you must not call profane. Well, what in the world does that mean? I mean, that sounds pretty serious. What God has called clean you must not call profane. And, and just then, according to Acts, the doorbell rings and in walks an emissary from a Roman military officer, a guy named Cornelius, who begs Peter to go back with them, you know, to Cornelius' house. And it's also odd. But with some prompting from the spirit, Peter agrees to go to this home of the Roman officer, even though such a thing is, is hardly ever done. And when they arrive at Cornelius' house, Cornelius and his whole household were waiting. I mean, he explains to Peter that he had had his own vision, his own dream, telling them to send for Peter. And Peter immediately begins to tell his household about the good news of Jesus Christ. All well and good. But mid-sentence, right, Peter is offering his testimony, but he's interrupted by his audience who begin to speak in tongues and praise God and get this exactly the same sort of behavior that Jesus' own followers had when the Holy Spirit comes on them back on Pentecost. Their minds are blown. Peter and his friends were astounded, Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit, and with that, suddenly Peter's vision of the heavenly buffet makes sense. I mean, he was not literally being told to eat lizards and birds of prey. He was being told to accept what God has clearly blessed, even though it ran contrary to everything that he knew. And so Peter asked, can anyone withhold water from these people to whom God has already given the Holy Spirit? And with that, Gentiles, non-Jews, outsiders, even some who were uncircumcised, who ostensibly had broken God's law by eating all sorts of dirty animals, Gentiles of all people, Gentiles, were baptized as Christians. It was a broadening of God's table, the very welcome of God. Meanwhile, Peter's Christian friends back in Jerusalem get wind of all of this. What is Peter doing talking to those people? What is he doing eating with them, letting, let alone baptizing them? And they called him in to explain, you know, which was the reading we had today. And he told them what had happened. And he concluded, if then God gives them the same gift that God gave us when we believed in our Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? And there you have it, another story of God's surprising, expanding grace. But, but that conversation was not the end of our great debate, of course. Indeed, this question of who is in and who is out in the church or in our culture has never completely gone away. But in that day, when Jesus' first followers heard the story of Cornelius and Peter, they opened the door a little wider because they learned that God accepted people whom they had no qualms about rejecting. In one sense, this whole story is a piece of our ancient history. The explanation of how a Jewish sect came to be a multi-ethnic global movement. But it's not just a piece of ancient history. I mean, it's our story, a story that guides us when we think about who is in and who is out first, right? To all insiders, 
to all those who, like Peter, who, who have the power, the power to keep people out or to make them feel excluded, this story pushes us to widen our embrace of those we consider outsiders. What God has called clean, we must not call profane. Those whom God has accepted, we must not reject. I mean, 2,000 years ago, somehow, the church learned to open its arms to people whose customs and behavior had previously seemed so wrong to them. But this story shouts down the corridors of history. To us today, with Peter's discovery, God shows no partiality. God's table is open to all. In God's house, there are many rooms, room enough for all, and we are not to put we are not put here to be doorkeepers, but servants. There's so much to learn there. But the story of Cornelius isn't just a story for those who are insiders. It is also a story for those who feel like outsiders. Because this isn't just Peter's story. You're reading it wrong if you hear just Peter's story. It is also Cornelius's story. How must Cornelius have felt if he, a Roman centurion, had to call for a Jewish man he'd never met? He must have wondered whether his ethnicity would have been offensive so as to turn Peter away. He must have wondered whether his personal eating habits would be repulsive to his new Jewish friends. This is an outsider's story. And guess what? That's every one of us, too. I, I am sure that every last one of us has felt one time or another that we are the stranger standing on the porch. I mean, in my time as pastor working and preaching and praying and teaching, I am struck by the number of people who have confided in me at one time or another that they feel that they don't belong. I mean, not just new people finding their way, sometimes long time ordained leaders, pillars of a community. I was not raised Presbyterian or I don't live in the right part of town, or, or I'm divorced, or I'm more conservative than most of the people here, or I'm more liberal than most people here. I'm an artist in a sea of bankers. I never went to college. I want to talk about theology, and they don't want to. I'm queer. I, I don't dress like these people do. I don't know the Bible very well. I have a disability. I'm young and single. I'm retired, and on and on and on and on. All reasons why we are not like everyone else. All reasons to feel like we are outsiders. So here's the thing. Cornelius, right, the so-called outsider, was a gift to the church. Cornelius' conversion was a direct challenge to the early Christian community's exclusivity. An outsider brought change to the very heart of the Christian faith. And the early Christians needed Cornelius. God needed Cornelius. They needed him to be, to be himself, different as he was, so that they could learn that God shows no favoritism. So you're not like the rest of the group in some way. Good, good, we need you. We need your voice. We need to see the world through your eyes. You belong here, not because you are like the rest, but because you are yourself. And God has called you here. The Apostle Paul liked to describe the whole community of the church uh, like, like it was one big body, the body of Christ out in the world. Some of us are hands, some of us are feet, some of us are ears, some of us are eyes. And Paul said, the eye can't say because I'm an eye, I don't belong to the body. And likewise, he said, the eye can't say to the hand, you're not like me, I don't need you. Just as every part fits into a beautiful whole, every person in the community is necessary. Being different from others doesn't mean you don't belong. It means you matter more than ever. You're invited here by Christ, and we all need you. Herein lies a paradox. In the end, each of us is both outsider and insider. I mean, we're outsiders because not one of us deserves to be here. We're all in this community of grace by God's grace alone, and we need to hear others say that we are welcome too. 
but we are also insiders. We are insiders because we have been drawn to the household of God and invited to God's table to share the gifts that only we can offer. And as insiders, each one of us has been given the task of extending welcome to the rest. We're all outsiders and we're all insiders. What a strange thing indeed. But so it is in the kingdom of God. A different ending to the parable, you know, the one from about 10 minutes ago. The woman sits on her porch swing, her gifts from the friends, uh, for her friends strewn about. Inside, the friends whisper, she's still out there, isn't she? One asks. Yes, maybe we should let her in. It's her house, after all. I'm starting to wonder whether we should all leave altogether, says a third. She's right, we're guests too. We don't deserve her hospitality more than anyone else. Another said, if you think about it, she actually seems to prefer people who make a big mess. We clearly like things neat and tidy. We just don't fit in with the rest of her friends. Another sighed, you're right, we don't belong here. I don't think she wants us in her house and her other friends would all be glad if we left. Slowly, they open the door. The woman looked at them from the porch swing. One friend said, we're leaving now. You can have your house back. The woman laughed softly and gently shook her head. Stay, my foolish, beloved friends. You belong here because I invited you. You each have so much to offer to the rest. Come inside now. Just remember not to shut the door behind you. May we join this dream of a different world and in so doing, help create a welcoming community for all, for all. May it be so. Amen.